Welcome to Econ Roots, your podcast on the roots of economic thought. I'm Stefan. And I'm Otto. Let's get on with today's conversation. Welcome, dear listeners, to this installment of Econ Roots, an episode uh, both me, Stefan, and you, Otto, uh, have been looking forward to, I think, because we have to talk about growth now, and that is so important. But before we get to that, Otto, I, I do have a bit of podcasting news, which... Uh, might be news to you, I don't know, but um, it will probably be news to our non-Danish listeners because um, it turns out that the best thing you can be in this world, apparently, is some of the highest things you can strive to is be a podcast host. Did you know that? Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody knows. The, the reason why I'm saying it is, of course, based on data, and that's because our prime minister has started a podcast. Did you know that? Yes. Yes. Have you heard it? No. No, me neither, to be honest. But uh, I just think it's so cool that the highest thing C can be is basically us. <laughs> but you know what? The first thing I would do if I were prime minister of Denmark was also. You would resign? <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yeah. No, no. but I would, <laughs> I would definitely not have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I take it out of the way. We are happy that you are listening in to, the, to today's conversation, which is about growth, an important uh, topic, maybe the most important topic uh, in economics. Um, and um, just to get us off before we take the three stars of today, uh, which is uh, Solov, of uh, Northhausen Römer. Um, I like to talk a little bit about with Otto uh, why growth is important. Uh, we were lucky to have economist Tyler Cohen visit us for a while back, and he calls uh, growth a stop and attachment of economics, something that we have to uh, always remember to prioritize. Why do you think he does that, Otto? But because it is uh, one of the most important uh, phenomena mm -hmm. in, in, in the modern world. Uh, and, and we should stress in the modern world because growth is something new, and, and but maybe we shouldn't take it for for, for as much as granted as, as we do. I think that there's a couple of good points in that. Uh, DJ Maklowski calls it the, the great enrichment comes from growth, right? Uh, which is a relatively modern phenomenon. And taking it for granted is also important not to do. Uh, I give many high school talks and these students, uh, bless them, uh, tend to take uh, take growth for granted. Um, I think sometimes it's because uh, it's a, it's like an um, exponential function. So, you know, it happens a little over the time and that's hard for our brains to really comprehend. But when you look through the century, it's just insane what we have seen, right? Like uh, if we go back to the turn, uh, to the beginning of the 20th century, most families spend around 70% of their household income on food. And now we're less than 10%. And uh, if you have to spend that much on food, like oh, around 70%, there's there's no foreign travel, there's no holidays, there's there's no fashion clothes, there's none of this stuff, right? You have to work all the time. And, and one of the things that I tell these students that surprises them is that, even the fact that they can go to school is because of growth, right? Because school in both Latin and Greek actually means leisure time, right? And you don't have leisure time if you have to spend that much time on food, right? And and, and thanks to growth, that's not the case, right? Growth really is the is uh, an extremely important modern phenomenon. Um, if we if we go back in time um, from from the uh, birth of Christ <laughs> on, on, until the, the in, industrial revolution uh, 200 years ago. Um, the, the most optimistic estimates uh, say that the, the living standards, D GDP per capita, which is what we usually talk about when we're talking about growth, uh, was, uh, was about a doubling. So our ancestors, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution were perhaps uh, twice, they had twice the, uh, the living standard uh, that they had 2,000 years earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look at our living standards today compared to what uh, they had at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, if you look at the figures for Denmark, it's... Uh, 24 times 24 times and you should and you should then that you should count that uh, not only is the the uh, gdp per capita per year higher uh the, the 24 times uh we live twice as long so 
So uh, if if you look at it, your living standard over your whole lifespan is 50 times that of your ancestors. Uh, it's an incredible number, incredible it's number. And even Denmark has had a, 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 an impressive growth rate. Uh, but even if you look at the world, it's uh, it's a multiple of 14 times, and all over the world, uh, our our life expectancy has, has been growing as, as well. So we are enormously much richer. And one of our laureates today, uh, Bill Lothard, has even claimed that our uh, usual way of measuring. Uh, DDP uh, is insufficient. Um, and he has looked at, th- at something interesting. Uh, he, he has looked at the price of light, <laughs> artificial light, <laughs> yeah. uh, going back in time. And uh, when he, he, he looked at the price of light going back 200 years, it's, it's not a, a multiple of 14 or 24 times. It's a multiple of 900 times, <laughs> 900 times. And if you look at what you can buy for uh, how, how much you can buy uh, f- uh, with your time, um, when you look at the, the wages you earn, it's much, much more. Uh, and so uh, that that is an illustration of, of, of what how important growth is. And if and if, if you had the opportunity to go back in time and meet your your ancestors 200 years ago and and they were to to ask you what the most important thing we can do for you <laughs> uh, you you would probably answer make sure that uh, that 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 we have economic growth yeah. uh, because that that's the reason why you have this incredible living standard com- compared to them and and the same is uh, probably true for our ancestors. If we go forward, we have uh, growth going forward. They will look back at our living standards and they will pity us. <laughs> say, How could they ever <laughs> be so <laughs> poor? <laughs> How could they live like that? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, they even they knew pain uh, yeah. uh, once in a while, and um, so. Um, I, I I agree. It's uh, growth is really important. Yeah, it's Tyler gave me this example when he was here, Tyler Cohen, which I really liked. He said that every year around eight million people dies from air pollution, and when you mention this fact to people, they think it's about global warming and so on. It's not. Most, six million of those or so is because they are still using fire and coal indoors to heat their houses and cook their food and so on, which give you pollutants, which you die from, right? And that's because they're poor, right? But if we have growth, they will not be poor forever, right? They're they're generally because we used to do that as well and then not that many generations ago we would fire with uh, with burning wood and fossils and so on inside we don't do that anymore um so it is actually one thing about growth which many people don't understand it's not about making the rich richer it's actually also about generally lowering uh, generally uh, uh, increasing sorry not low increasing living standards especially for the low lowest uh, levels of society and and the world um which makes it a really worthy cause i think to to focus on growth uh, but something that many people misunderstand another thing we'll talk about today and we'll need to get going on the on on the on the stars of the show but is that uh, many people tend to think that growth is about spending more resources when in fact it's not but we'll get to that we'll get to that um Cool. So those are some good uh, observations as to why uh, growth is so important. So I think we should just get on with it. Should we, Otto? Yeah, sure. lovely. So we'll start with uh, with uh, Solov, and I'll just give his bio, and then we'll talk about what his contribution was and have a little discussion about that. So uh, his full name is Robert Merton Solo. He's actually an order of Prince Henry. I did not know that, but he was. Uh, he was born August uh, um, 20. 23rd, uh, 1924. So he's almost 100 years old, yes. which uh, begs the question, is he the oldest living economist in the world? Which is a good question. I don't know. I haven't researched it, but it's it's interesting. I don't uh, know. I, I don't know either. Um, he's, um, he's American. He was born in Brooklyn, New York, into a Jewish family. He regarded his parents as being very intelligent, but they did not have the chance to go to college. Uh, however, he did. He actually excelled really early. He went to uh, Howard College on a scholarship at the age of 16, which is pretty impressive, I must say. Uh, besides economics, he uh, have also studied a bit of anthropology and sociology. Um, however, he um, he got to meet basically Leontief pretty early and uh, 
from him, he got an early interest in modeling, basically, which would be very important for his career. And in fact, he calls himself in his uh, Nobel lecture, he calls himself a natural born macroeconomist, which is, I think, is an interesting term. Um, however, before he started his academic career, his fluency in German made him a very valued inception officer in the U.S. Army during World War II, where he was stationed abroad. Uh, and when he returned home, he married his uh, his wife, uh, Barbara, uh, which he's only been dating for six months. So that was, you know, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Seal the deal. <laughs> and, and he seems to be a very loyal person because he spent his entire career at MIT since 1949. They're still married? I think so. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, uh, I think so. Four of his PhD students, uh, George Agloff, Joseph Stiglitz, Peter Diamond, and William Nordhaus, who's a good to later today, actually got the Nobel Prize. Um, and he got it in uh, in uh, 87. And um, he got it for his contribution to the theory of economic growth. He's also a uh, John Bates Clark Medal recipient in 61 and a Presidential Medal of Freedom recipient in 2014. Um, uh, and I have a couple of points here. Well, well, we can get to that. Yeah, I'm, yeah. let's take this now. So one of the things he was involved in was the, uh, before we get to why he got the prize, was the, was the Cambridge Capital controversy, um, uh, which is still, I guess, unsettled, right? It's like Some people say it's settled, some people were not. It was a battle between the growth boys of MIT, right, him and Samuelson, and uh, the post-Keynesians at, at Cambridge. Uh, about basically um, uh, how much you could aggregate and still um, uh, in the measure of capital exactly in the measure of capital, and he, he comments on it in his um, um, in his uh, in his Nobel speech, which I'll just give a couple of um, uh, lines here. He says, "If I may revert to a methodological propaganda again, I would I like that term methodological propaganda. <laughs> I would like to remind my colleagues and the readers that every piece of empirical economics rests on a substructure of background assumptions that are probably not quite true. For instance, these total factor productivity calculations require not only that market prices can serve as a rough and ready approximation of marginal products, but that aggregation does not hopelessly distort these." relationships. Under those circumstances, robustness should be the supreme economic uh, econometric virtue and overinterpretation is the endemic econometric vice. That's a good thing to keep in mind, I think, for most people. So uh, background made a lot of contribution. So why why did he deserve to get the prize? Well, he, he gave us the basic framework, the basic model uh, we use when we when we think about uh, economic growth and the economic pro process over time. Um, that's uh, Solos uh, model. He, he wrote a very famous article in uh, 1956 called The Contribution to Economic Growth. And he put forward a, a, the model that we are a sort of basic model we are we are still using today and that basic model can always also be used uh, to uh, to account for economic growth mm -hmm. it's important that we, we know where which are the sources to to economic growth uh, if, if we look at it over time so that 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 was uh, that is important if, if we look at basically what his 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 theory is about is <laughs> We should probably mention, by the way, that uh, Trevor Swan came up with something similar at the same time and so yeah. on. So sometimes we sort of share the credit with him, but let's move on. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. And then you can yeah, go just back a side to back. others like uh, Ramsey or uh, yeah. did, uh, had similar ideas in, in the in the 1920s yeah. already. So, so, And Adam Smith as well also was focused yes. on growth and so on. So we go further back, but whatever, just, just but, a side uh, line. But... Uh, Salo's uh, article proved very, very uh, influential, yeah. uh, and 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 his way of doing it, his way of thinking, was very clear. So I, I think it was very well deserved that he got the Nobel Prize, uh, and and we see him as uh, as, as as one of the founders in, uh, of our theory. Um, basically, what he's looking at is looking at the economic process as uh, a process where you have some inputs <laughs> you can almost look at the economy as like kind of machine <laughs> <laughs> so you put uh, input into the machine and you uh, get some output and um, that output can be used for uh, 
either you can consume it or you can use it as new input. Uh, so that's basically the, the, the way it, it goes. And he has the two, basically uh, two, two kinds of input into the, to the machine. Um, you have labor and you have capital. Mm -hmm. And what you can produce with a machine is, especially in, in his version, is more capital. So, um, so, so uh, over time, you, you, you get growth because you get more capital. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, uh, what's uh, an important aspect of, of his modeling is that capital and labor, they are at the same time, they are substitutes. Um, so I can produce the same with less labor if I have more capital mm -hmm. and vice versa. Mm -hmm. But they are also uh, complements mm -hmm. in the sense that if you, if you, um, uh, add uh, one uh, one factor you would need uh, to, to for instance if you doubled the the, the amount of, of capital you would have to double the amount of labor to get the double uh, <laughs> amount of, 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 of production so but and, and that has these uh, assumption has an, some important uh, uh, implications in this model. So, um, over time, what happens? You could, will, will this go on forever? Not in his model. No. Because um, you, you can in increase capital by saving, uh, but some of the savings have uh, to uh, compensate for the fact that the, that the, the, the cap previous capital is depreciating. Mm -hmm. So, if your capital stock becomes large enough, all your savings will have to go to compensate for, mm -hmm. uh, for, for depreciation. So your net uh, savings will eventually reach zero. Yeah. And when they reach zero in the, uh, in the solo model, uh, growth will, will stop yeah. and uh, at, 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 at some, some, some level, and that will happen in, in, in all economies. But, uh, how fast you get there depends on the level of saving yeah. in, in, in the model. And then, of course, uh, um, he has the third element called the, uh, the solo residual. Yep. And so if, if I can produce more by adding more labor or adding more capital, but uh, you can also get more uh, from the same amount from one year to the next year. So uh, if productivity grows up, yeah, uh, the, or the total factor productivity, it's a uh, model, that usually it's, it's termed like the, it's a capital A, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a solo residual. And so that's basically what's unexplained in the model. And interestingly, um, when Solo used the model to produce an account, uh, pr produce growth accounting uh, to account for mm -hmm. how how, uh, how had had the growth in the beginning was the U.S. Uh, how, uh, what uh, what were the the most important factors? Uh, it turned out to be the Solo residual. Oh, uh, so 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 basically the the model told told him that there is something else What's going on going on which uh, we have to, to to be aware of and that might lead us to 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 some of our other uh, uh, stars superstars today, today. because yeah. they have they have been dealing with, with that question oh yeah I uh, I, I leave the, uh, the listeners hanging for just a moment because I, I know where you're going with this um, um, so, but before we leave solo, I think there's a couple of things to just uh, pick up on as well in, in what you said. So, um, I think his point, right, what, what he wanted to do, at least he says so in, in his lecture, is uh, that growth theory was invented to provide a systematic way to talk about and to compare equilibrium path for the economy, right? So, I think that's an important 
contribution as well that we get a language for comparing the trajectory of society exactly. right uh, and i know people don't like to judge and all that stuff nowadays but there is i mean there is good pal- policy and there's bad policy and and this is a, a way to actually have a, a a discussion around that that's not based on on opinions but actually based on on data and facts uh, so so i think that's a really important thing however it also leads uh, to a a bit of a um, often misunderstanding Uh, about the nature of economic science uh, is that uh, the models numbers should be 100% trusted and so, and so on, right? And he very deliberately said that you do not have to believe the accuracy of these numbers, right? The message they can put is pretty clear anyway, right? That's the point, right? So economic science is an exact science because there's exact relationship between these things, but it's not like we can say if we do this, the economy will grow by this decimal, right? So, so uh, and, and that for lay people can be sort of hard to yeah. grasp at yes. times, I think, right? And also for politicians and so on. Um, I think this is the one one more implication <laughs> of a theory that we should mention yep. uh, before going forward, and that is the answer to a to a to an interesting question: Can you have too much growth? Oh yeah, interesting. And uh, for, actually, uh, you can. Yeah, of course. If if you look at you, you could uh, in theory you could spend all the output. As uh, savings, yeah. In, th- yeah. in theory, it would not be not consume any. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and then the 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 the, the economy would grow yeah. grow much more, yeah. uh, much faster. Um, but over time, <laughs> you would spend all your resources on capital. In the end, you would end up in the extreme case yeah. in business, yeah. where you save everything and. Invested in, in new capital, you will end up with zero, <laughs> which is of course the, the the point of the whole point uh, of 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 economic activity is in the end to have consumption. So, yeah. So there is an optimal uh, growth path in 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 the solar model, and that was I think was uh, important to to realize at the time because at the time uh, when Uh, you were talking about development economics. Mm-hmm. There was an idea that it, you should just have as much capital accumulation as possible, uh, and that really, in in some cases, led to 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 over investing. Oh yeah. Um, for instance, in the Soviet Union, they wanted to 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 reach the level of of the West, and they 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 starved their their. Uh, <laughs> The the century uh, in order to uh, accumulate capital yeah. and uh, well they they failed for a lot of reasons but one of the reasons uh, were that they were over investing and they were not having and and not enough and basically they they lost uh, out because they they didn't have enough. The productivity growth yeah. in, in the yeah. solo residual exactly, which is also why solo nowadays is also often used when we talk about S curve developments, for instance, and, and in terms of this, that there is, you know, you, you start, you have a big return to your uh, to in this, uh, initially invested capital, then it sort of flattens out, and then if you wanted to start happening again, which is what we'll get to Roma in a little while, we have been seeing you for a while now, then you need something new to happen. Um, so just uh, to round it off, and then we'll move on. It's that. Uh, because going back to something else you said we cannot take growth for granted just like we can have too much growth we can very definitely have too little growth exactly. and we've been blessed with in our lifetime to generally only have positive growth we have had the years where it's gone uh, gone negative but over the time it's 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 positive uh, but it doesn't need to be like that just if you look at the history of Britain for instance they've had periods with insane negative growth uh, my favorite examples is just like when the Roman Empire left I mean you had these people running around basically looking at 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 very advanced capital goods that they have no idea how to produce or consume, right? Like central heating, uh, uh, houses that went over two floors and so on. Like for several centuries, you had people running around looking at how the world used to be better, right? There were literally like capital goods lying around they, could, exactly. they couldn't reproduce or use, right? So I think that's just an, as a wonderful historical example of that, right? Uh, yeah, and, and, and one thing I, I really didn't realize until I, 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 I read about it um, uh, was that We take it f- so much for granted yeah. that every generation is, uh, standard of living is better than the previous. Uh, take 
which see it almost as a law of nature. It's not. It's not. It's not uh, for for. It's a policy choice. If you go back, yes, and if you go back uh, when when you didn't have systematic growth, mm. uh, it was perfectly normal that uh, you would be worse off than your par- parents. Yeah. And actually, if you add to that <laughs> that. Uh, uh, it was you the, the usual case was that the the uh, the rich part of the population had much much more children than the, the than the, the, poor. the poor ones yeah so actually it, it the standard was that you were you were poorer than your your parents uh, yeah. not not richer yeah, that's, exactly. that's been with the case for thousands of years yeah um so it's only after the industrial revolution uh, that it has become a law of nature, oh, yeah. so to speak, that that every generation is better off than than the previous. This is such an interesting topic. Like, uh, we, that could be spent a lot more time on. Also, like you know, when we think back to previous uh, episodes about rational expectations and so on, like growth is, you know, you expect that now, right? But it might not be a rational thing to expect. But we 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 need to move on as well. But it's such an interesting topic. We might need to do a couple of econ talks on that at one point with some uh, some some guests. Um, so the next star of the show, which adds something really important to the growth uh, equation, so to speak, in more ways than one, is uh, Paul Michael Romer, born November 6th, uh, 1955, American uh, uh, economist and policy entrepreneur. He's a university professor at New York University. Um, he's prize motivation and got the prize uh, with Nordhaus, which is the last star of the show. Is uh, He got the prize in 2018 and he got it for integrating technological innovation in the long run macroeconomic analysis. And there you have it, listeners. That is that is the solar residual technology. But we'll get to that in a moment. Let's just finish up with Roma's bio before. Uh, he comes from a political family, a sort of like uh, a centrist political family. Uh, his um, uh, he was born. To, uh, his da- f- dad was uh, Roy Romer, who was a Colorado governor, actually, uh, and Beatrice B. Miller. Uh, he's four. He has four brothers and sisters, and one of his brothers, Chris Romer, is actually a former Colorado state senator. So it's a pretty engaged, politically engaged family. We can assume he graduated uh, Phillips Exeter Academy in 1973, and he earned a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and a PhD in Economics in 1983, both from University of Chicago, um, and he done graduate studies at MIT um, and he's also uh, briefly been at Queen's University in uh, Kingston, Canada. Uh, he, Besides his academic career, he's been a chief economist at the World Bank uh, and um, he is uh, uh, he also been at the University of Chicago, University of California, Berkeley, Stanford University Graduate School of Business and University of Rochester. He, besides the research he's done academically, he's been in the Natural Bureau of Economic Research, Stanford Center for International Development, Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, the Hoover Institution, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Center for Global Development. And he has been named in 1997, uh, so it's a while ago, but still one of the 70, uh, 25 most influential people by Time Magazine. Mm-hmm. Very, very impressive resume here. Yes. Um, and the last thing we need to uh, to also well two more things before we get to the theory. Um, he is actually an entrepreneur. He founded a company uh, called uh, Applier, um, which uh, allowed students to submit uh, uh, problem sets. College students, and it was actually purchased in two thousand seven by Centric Learning. So he's 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 done an exit. You know what all those business school students want to do. <laughs> And one last fun thing in his bio before we get to the theory is that he was actually married on the day he got the prize. Did you know that? No, no, no. Yes, he actually married on the day he got the prize to his uh, wife, uh, Caroline Bieber, who's a very extended French literature professor uh, at Bernard College. He was actually a Pulitzer Prize finalist at one point. And uh, because he is so accomplished, people people sometimes have apparently asked her if she would have married him if he hadn't gotten the Nobel Prize. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking uh, about that. Yeah. <laughs> she married him because of the Nobel <laughs> And apparently her, <laughs> apparently her answer was, I guess we'll never know. <laughs> Which I think is really cool. <laughs> but anyway, they married on the day he got the prize. So his cere- wedding ceremony was the prize ceremony. I, I, come back uh, come back when you get the Nobel Prize. Exactly. <laughs> then, then we'll talk. Then we'll talk. I like that. I like that. All right. So we already alluded to it a little bit so um, what it is that, that Roma does in, in for, for the theory of economic growth also well uh, in a sense he's, he's really reintroducing uh, some ideas that the Adam Smith had mm-hmm. 
about the Adam Smith talk, and I think we we, we touched upon this earlier. The the idea that uh, um, you could have increasing in terms the uh, returns to scale. Um, Adam Smith talked about it in in the context of the market, mm-hmm. saying that that uh, when when the the market increases, we can have more division of labor, and then we everybody can be better off. So, uh, and that's uh, what to a large extent Roma is focus, focusing on, um, and he's especially he's looking at the importance of ideas, mm-hmm. new knowledge. Um, and he is also he's not the, the 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 first to do this, but he is also looking at the uh, at labor from a quality perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, others, for instance, uh, Robert Lucas, mm-hmm. whom we were talking about earlier, uh, uh, said you might you might not uh, be able to produce more human capital in the sense that the economy will produce more people. It, it, it could mm-hmm. it historically yeah but uh, but 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 but, the, but nowadays we don't f- think of the 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 uh, economy as a machine producing more people but it is in a sense producing more people in in the sense that that uh, we can uh, increase the uh, our the value of of uh, of labor yeah by, by educating uh, people and and so on, but but the idea was in in Roma is that as we get richer, we um, uh, we 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 can get a higher return to knowledge. So it will get a technological uh, advances will uh, depend on on the level of the um, on on of which the economy uh, is. Um, is, is currently at. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, if we had lived a hundred thousand years ago, our knowledge of economics would be of little value to us. Oh yeah, maybe a little bit, but 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 not much. Now we're living off the, the knowledge, our knowledge of economics, yeah. and that's because we are in a, in a larger uh, and richer economy. So, uh, what? Uh, Roma is really looking for and is the uh, uh, the possibility of the economy um, as it grows um, creating new impulses mm-hmm. to more growth. Whereas in in the solar model, it will sort of peter out yeah, in the yeah. long run. But that is not necessarily the case in 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 a in a in a in a, in a solar model. Actually, what is one of the 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 interesting factors limiting growth in the solar model is that uh, as we go richer, uh, as we uh, we we have uh, we have a love for variety. Yeah. So uh, and even if uh, we uh, we can have increasing returns to scale in production, meaning that if you double the input, you more than double the output. You can produce perhaps more than double the number of cars if you double the the input but we will also have a love for variety so so uh, instead of just having one brand uh, one kind of car <laughs> we'll have lots of, yes. uh, of, of cars that and that that could mean that we sort in in a sense uh, reduce our potential uh, compared to the world where we just had one car yeah. and produced uh, a, a lot of cars, but that wouldn't wouldn't actually make a lot of sense. So, love of variety makes a lot of sense, but it is a limiting factor, and yeah. in, in, it becomes a, a limiting factor in in this model. But basically, you, you can you can I th- I, th- I thought it was quite a stroke of genius of the Nobel Prize Committee to award it together the prize together with with Nordhaus yeah. because. Both are basically talking about the uh, consequences of crowding, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and in a sense, we are. Uh, what happens when we, we when that we are more people and more economic activity? Uh, things get more crowded, but is that a good or bad thing? Oh yeah, and uh, in Roma's story, it's actually a good thing. It's a good thing. So yeah. crowding, crowding has 
positive effects. Yeah. Uh, for when I was going to high school, um, everybody was talking about uh, the risk of overpopulation uh, and uh, that we would run out of resources uh, because it would be swallowed by an increase in pop an exp explosion yeah, in population. Yeah. Um, and that's not what has happened. Yeah. We have had an enormous growth of population since the in, in Industrial Revolution. Um, doubled many times, probably not going to double any uh, again. Uh, but but uh, as it has doubled, uh, we have not become poorer, we become richer. You are listening to Econ Roots, your podcast on the history of economic thought. Thank you for joining the conversation. I think there's a lot of interesting things to just shortly uh, unwrap here. Um, so one of the reasons why I think many people are still a um, Marshallian and they think that the, the world is going to run out of resources and that growth can't go on forever and all that stuff is because, and I think Roma is good as pointing this out, he says this story is about the conflict between scarcity and progress. How do we explain this enormous progress in a world that's ultimately scarce? full of scarce resources. And it's actually because a lot of the growth we do uh, manifests in, in innovation that actually makes us use less resources. Exactly. Right. And um, so, for instance, the iPhone, imagine like if you needed all that kind of stuff that the iPhone can do in individual things, you would need more plastic, metal, all that kind of, more labor to produce it, all that kind of stuff to ship it and so on. Um, but also imagine what that then makes it possible. Right? Like, uh, I, I sometimes tell students that if we had the corona a lockdown 10 years earlier there wouldn't have been Netflix so you would have to go to like the blockbuster if that had been allowed to be open and they would have then ordered like a a ton of extra DVDs that we would not be stuck with. Like we would have like so many copies of, of horrible B romantic comedies and stuff <laughs> like, like a total waste. Right. So, so thank, uh, thank we didn't have that. One of the reasons why I really like this Roma idea, and I've also used his work on this is that the idea that while natural resources are stuck in a sticky and specific places and some countries are blessed or cursed with them, depending on what kind of policy they implement, uh, ideas actually just spread. We can actually just make them spread. And and as a Dane, this is a big reason why I think we saw the growth we did in the 20th centuries in Denmark, because many of our main entrepreneurs who founded the, the big companies that drive our economy, they went abroad and stole ideas and then implemented them in daily, in, in different ways, right? Uh, Tietgen and uh, uh, the, the Carlsberg family and all these kind of ideas. So, so the idea that ideas kind of spread on this, even like a company like Lego, like the Lego idea is unique probably, but what you can use Lego for is it's unending, right? So uh, so uh, I, I use Roma a lot in my uh, coming book on Danish capitalism because he explains this a lot. What, what's actually happening here. Um, so um, uh, I think that's important. And another thing though, that, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that I think we should just talk about, have you, uh, have you read about his idea of chartered cities? Yes. Yes. Um, what do you think of it? I think it's, it's an interesting idea. The idea is that, that uh, governance plays uh, an important role for growth. Yeah. Actually one, one of the, the questions uh, Roma starts out with is the question: Why are there so much difference in in, uh, in 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 standard of living across nations? Yeah. If you take the standard solar solar model, there's, there shouldn't be any difference. Mm. Uh, not uh, they they would tend to to there would be a, a lot of convergence uh, to to a common level, and we haven't seen uh, that much. Uh, Convergence, as you should expect, not not even the ex the conversion you should expect in in the basic Roma model no, either. Because yeah, no. ideas they they spread and yeah, exactly. everybody so why, can can. Yeah, why is it some countries are still uh, so poor? Uh, yeah, exactly. yeah. It's, 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 uh, nowadays they, they don't keep it secret. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so they, it can be used in 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 Denmark, in in Brazil, uh, in Congo. Uh, if, if if you want to, but but even even if if that's the case, we see differences, yeah. uh, and um, that has to do with the the the, the governance structure. Uh, so Roma's idea was to say, what if we took the governance structure of a of a successful city and implemented it 
in a, in a city in a less successful country. Uh, so he has been, uh, for instance, taking. Uh, I don't know if I don't think Copenhagen is that uh, <laughs> good an example, <laughs> no. but uh, Frederiksberg is better. But, but, uh, <laughs> Used you could, to. You could you could take a city in uh, most cities in Europe are, yeah. are, are, are pretty well uh, run compared to most cities in cities uh, in in Latin America. Why not take uh, the the rules from Copenhagen and and use them uh, somewhere in, in in Latin America? Yeah. And he's been looking for for actually for for a city to do exactly that. I don't think he has been. <laughs> no, Honduras tried, but then they gave, gave up on it. I really like the idea. I'm a big favor of it because I think it's uh, a solo has this idea saying that economists should work on problems that are huge, have huge impacts, but are still potentially solvable, right? So there are some problems that are so big that you can't ever really prove it, but you should work on this. I think this is an idea where you could actually literally help the world if you acknowledge the fact that some countries are better run than others. However, this is one of the reasons why it's not been implemented because people don't want to acknowledge that, right? They don't want to say, you know, they think it's neocolonialism and so on. Mm. But I actually think this is a way that the West could potentially help a lot of developing countries, like saying, okay, we'll run this city and the people of your citizens want to live there, gets to live here, but we'll run it for you. I think it's a great idea. It's certainly better than what the UK and Denmark is doing now, doing doing refugee camps in other countries, which is just really weird, right? I think this would actually help these countries. I think it's a great idea, right? But this is this is the way a lot of business. Is yeah, exactly. Working. I mean, uh, basically, what McDonald's is is is, is a set of rules. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> so, it's a set of rules. So, so uh, I, I can open a. Hamburger restaurant as well. Yeah. Um, I can also make it a McDonald's yeah. restaurant if I uh, if I abide by certain rules yeah. set by the McDonald's and I yeah. pay them for it and uh, uh, they will uh, say how how you're going you're going to do this and customers will expect uh, this service and you're going mm. to give it to them. Uh, otherwise, you can't be a McDonald's. And if customers are happy with it, and uh, and they seem to be, then that that is going to spread. So basically, that, so exactly. that's it's like the nation as a franchise, basically. Yes, that, yeah, that's, uh, what Romans was trying, but it it, it hasn't been as successful as uh, McDonald's. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so um, uh, we we are running uh, quickly out of time here, but uh, we we do still have one uh, star left, which was the co-recipient with uh, with Paul Romer, uh, and that's William uh, Downey Nordhaus, born uh, May thirty first. In 1941, American again, Sterling Professor of Economics at Yale University, um, and uh, he got the reason why he got it uh, with Nordhaus was for integrating climate change into long-run macroeconomic analysis, uh, which is a negative idea of crowding, which is what exactly. you talked about. Nordhaus was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, the son of Virginia Ricks and Roberts uh, J. Nordhaus, who uh, founded the, the Sandia Peak Theme uh, tr- Tramway. Sorry, Tramway. Sorry, um, and he's from a German Jewish family. And his uh, uh, his father migrated from uh, from Paderborn in uh, uh, um, uh, in um, in the past. Uh, so one of the reasons why it's important to mention this here is because North House actually grew up with the love of the outdoors and appreciation of nature. And that drives a lot of why he's looking at the negative side of crowding, I think. Uh, so while uh, while Romer was motivated probably by some other discussions in, in his home, North, uh, North House was motivated by other things. He's graduated from the Phillips Academy in Andover and subsequently received his BA and MA from Yale in 63 and 73, respectively. He was actually a member of Skull and Bones there, just like uh, George Bush. Right, the very, very important things. He uh, he holds a certificate from Institut des Etui uh, Politique and uh, a P- I'm bad at French. A PhD from MIT, um, and he's also been at Cambridge. Uh, and he worked also in actually administrating uh, uh, academics. So he's been like a provost and vice president for for finance administration uh, and at Yale and so on. Uh, so he. Um, He's widely read, not just by economists, also by ph- uh, philosophers, and he's uh, uh, he's used uh, as an advisor a lot. Um, 
before we go down to your theory, which I don't think will take that long necessarily because it's very straightforward, uh, we just need to mention there was actually a co-writing with Samuelson, his uh, Samuelson's very famous economics book, right? The, the textbook uh, for uh, from the 12th edition to the 19th edition. So, uh, so he had, in that sense, a very direct impact on many graduate students in economics, right? So uh, that's important to mention. Um, so climate tax, I guess, is the theory, right? Or yes. carbon tax, sorry. Yes, that's, that's, that's what he basically is recommending. Um, so, uh, you're absolutely right that uh, Nordhaus is about the negative side of, of crowding, in a, in a sense. Um, of the fact that as uh, we, we, we wouldn't have had the, the level of, uh, uh, of well-being we have today, the living standard, uh, by far without fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So fossil fuels have been an important input into producing our wealth. But there is a negative side effect of uh, fossil fuels, especially uh, in, in the sense that it produces uh, CO2, mm -hmm. uh, greenhouse gas, which is a greenhouse gas, and which is also uh, contributing to um, to, uh, to to heating our climate. And heating our climate could have a negative effect. So what Nordhaus re did was just like Solo uh, started out to think about how do we integrate the effect of, uh, of uh, climate change into our economic model. And um, what is, and he, he did that by on, on one hand looking at the positive effect of emitting carbon uh, and at the same time the negative effect. And the basic idea uh, in his, uh, his model, he produced the, the first climate model, it's called DICE. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, and so-called integrated assessment model, model which yes. is used yeah. for, for, for climate uh, economics, climate science. Uh, uh, all the time. The, the basic idea is that that um, as as you if you uh, increase uh, the the uh, uh, number of or the, the the level of of uh, greenhouse gases, you'll have a negative effect, which will start to compete with the positive effect <laughs> of the the process mm -hmm. which which uh, is is resulting in in in, uh, in 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 the emission of, of greenhouse gases so the basic idea idea uh, really is that you should look for a, a path where uh, you allow for the positive effects or, or allow for the effects which have the side effects of emission uh, emitting greenhouse gases but only to the to the point where the cost of uh, of global warming is higher than the benefit of the pr uh, process producing yeah. uh, greenhouse ga uh, gas emissions. So it's important to balance these two things. Um, and you could say, why why doesn't the market take care of it by itself? It also balances things. Uh, yeah. In uh, if if I use a, a a scarce resource in production. Uh, if as it becomes more and more scarce, I, it, its price is going up, and I will use less of it. So yeah. I will sort of balance my my use of scarce resources. Uh, if we talk on, talk about natural resources, you could also see the the atmosphere as a sort of. Uh, Scarce resource. It has a limited capacity for holding uh, uh, greenhouse gases without uh, uh, creating too much uh, global warming. So, the, but 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 we don't have a price on 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 the on on emitting um, uh, uh, unless uh, uh, global uh, uh, we don't have a price on greenhouse gases. Uh, like we have a price on coal, oil, uh, other other scarce resources. So uh, the, the basic implication of Nordhaus model is that we should have a 
political price instead. And that price should be set to the uh, it would be e- equal to the to the marginal uh, cost of emitting uh, greenhouse gases in terms of of, glo- of global he- heating. And so, so he has produced yeah. p- proposed uh, a tax, and he has also uh, tried to to uh, to calculate what what would be the sort of so called optimal level of global warming uh, <laughs> if we take into account that it both has it has a cost and a, a, and a benefit and uh, actually he is um, his uh, his calculation is says that we should accept uh, global warming uh, global warming of three degrees Celsius over the uh, compared to pre-industrial uh, uh, revolution times yeah um so and that's that that's actually more than than the the world is aiming for in the paris uh, accords which is uh um uh, it's 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 one and a half to two uh, two degrees but uh, actually if we look at at what they have agreed to do <laughs> it's uh it will produce uh global heating of around uh, three three degrees so so maybe Uh, Maybe he's a, not that bad. <laughs> exactly. So one of the reasons why I like him is because um, I think it's there's so much sound economics in this solution to a to a combo. It's 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 acknowledging it's a, it's an externality. It's acknowledging it's a trade off. Saying like there is a trade off because we generally want growth. We want people to to increase in living standard and all these kind of things, and that has a price. So that's right. I also like the fact that if you do a carbon tax. And whether that's political possible, or that's another thing, right? It it's potentially cuts off a lot of lobbying if if this could actually come out. But but I also like the fact that even if we just implement it, what will companies do? They will put that to the consumers. They'll have to pay, but then the consumers still have free choice whether you want you know steaks or go to Thailand, right? You know, which is fine. It's free choice, right? Which what you want ethically as economists. Um, but then what will probably happen is that a company will use their very specific division of labor derived knowledge to green their production so they don't have to pay this carbon tax. So it's still competitive, right? So we'll actually get innovation running in a way we want without trying to micromanage it with all those problems that has. I think there's so much sound economics in an North House solution, yes. which I think is so good. And and I like your point in then saying that he might actually be right with the three degrees, right? You know, which could be uh, yes. interesting. Um, It's interesting. He 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 started out, but uh, he started to, to to study the impact of climate change long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in in the seventies, um, and uh, so so he's really been a pioneer, and that was re- recognized by the uh, uh, by the Nobel Prize yeah. Committee uh, by giving the first. Uh, <laughs> Prize ever awarded for for for, for climate economics, uh, but he is not an alarmist. No, no, uh, because basically because this, this analysis is telling him that 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 we should not be alarmist. We we should be careful not to have too much global warming, but uh, but uh, but but uh, we should also be careful not to 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 do things to prevent global warming that is uh, doing much more harm than good. Yeah, exactly. And and just a little side caveat to the history of thought here. Many people now, they, when they hear externalities, they think about pollution and the environment. That was not how that started. He was a very early pioneer. First, originally we didn't care so much about externalities. It wasn't important because we weren't rich enough to care. Mm-hmm. Then we started, so most of the externality theory was actually developed to, to deal with labor relations mainly. And then it's been applied later on to what we care about now, the environment because we're rich because we've had growth right now we can actually care about birds and stuff right <laughs> stuff. anyway la- one last thing uh, before we finish up because we have run way over time sorry dear listeners but this is such an important topic to both of us one thing that I think we need to comment on I, at least I like to comment on and see about or if you want to join in I think North House give a good reason why government has a role to play in setting the right policy incentives and maybe even a form of global government and sort of maybe not one government but some sort of global agreement however tax. a tax oh, a tax a that everybody can sign up to it does need to be a global government obviously but uh, at least there's that one thing that's I'm a little bit sad about Romer though not so much in his writing but when you hear him give interviews and so on is that he's very fond of government and it's always 
confused me a little bit because uh, he says it's it's an ideological thing. He thinks people on the right is just hating on government for that for no for ideological reasons. And if he hears this, then I'm sorry if he thinks I'm doing that too. But actually, that's not my point. My point is theoretical, is that I think sometimes Roma confuses government with governance. We can have plenty of governance without government. And when we do have government to install governance, it's not like the other things that start with a capital G, God, that just go instant and benevolent and does everything. It's populated by people that makes mistake who have imperfect knowledge and their own incentives, which we'll talk about in later episodes when we get to public choice, which Northout also worked on, right? He did a little bit of public choice. So, And I think, and I'm sad about that, I think Orma sometimes confuses government and governance. And I think he's... He's ignoring the problem that comes with trying to do governance with government, right? Uh, which, uh, which I think is, 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 it annoys me a little bit. What, what's your take on this? Well, it's, I think it's, it's, it is fairly frequent for, for economists to, to become constructivists. Yeah. Uh, to, to, and to be tempted by the idea that you have, if you had a planner, uh, who was perfect, yeah. And they're, uh, in their uh, benevolence and their information and so on, um, then you could do a lot of things. Yeah. You could do a lot of things. I think, um, uh, but we have to realize that you could, you could basically, you could ask why, why don't businesses just do yeah. a lot of good things? Well, they are, economists understand that they are, they are on, uh, operating on the rules uh, of the market. So, uh, so, so there are certain things they have to do. The same is true for politicians. Yeah. Uh, you have to realize that. And so politicians can make uh, policy mistakes, uh, and but then they can also make policy mistakes. Uh, they, they, can, they can make uh, uh, mistakes which are uh, systematic yeah. rather than 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 than. than uh, uh, the result of poor knowledge, so I think I think that's that's important to to realize. And and uh, as you mentioned, Nordhaus is much more aware of this. Yeah. He actually very early on in his, his career studied uh, political business cycles, yeah. where the idea is that that uh, while you could, and we talked about this uh, earlier, while you. Uh, ideally, you could smooth out the business cycles by economic policy. Uh, but if you add the uh, political incentives, for instance, to win the next election, <laughs> next election yeah. you, that could not uh, only uh, prevent that from happening, that could create business cycles of their own. And that has been a, a topic started by Nordhaus. That is scarily relevant right now, I think, with the inflation rising and yes. the political response and so on. That is actually very scarily relevant. But yeah, I, I agree. So we'll, we'll, we'll finish up now. It's just, I agree with this because just like you can probably have too little government, some would say, uh, you can also have way too much government if it's, if it's not functioning correctly. And I don't think North, uh, I don't think uh, Roymar, which I really I am a big fan of his theoretical contribution, used it a lot, but I don't think he acknowledges that point enough. Like you have third world countries where the problem is the government, right? Like, you know, it's there, but it's just horribly dysfunctioning and holding society back. And first world the first government world government too. So, so, yeah. so, uh, and, and uh, I, making policy yeah. that's, that's not uh, that's holding us back. Exactly. And, and climate policy really is an example of that. It, you could you could argue that it started out as a market failure yeah. in the sense that you didn't have a price uh, on on emis, emitting uh, carbon uh, into the atmosphere, but it has turned into a, a government failure oh, yeah. instead because. Even if, and almost all economists, they recognize that the right approach to this problem is a uniform carbon tax. We don't have a uniform. We don't have one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Even within a country like Denmark, we don't have a uniform. No, no, there's tax. still special the interests. Emitting greenhouse gases is 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 uh, varying from uh, ex- extremely high. Uh, level ten times the the global externality uh, to nothing. Nothing. Yeah, 
um, agree. And uh, so, so I think that's just something that needs to be said. And I don't think that's an ideological issue. I think this is an empirical issue and a theoretical issue. I don't think, of course, ideology plays into it at some principle level, but I, I don't think it's an ideological issue. But anyway, thank you, dear listeners, and thank you, Otto, for bearing with me. This this ran too long, but it was just such a good talk. It was invigorating. Uh, so. Very, very three very important uh, uh, lorries this time. Exactly, and maybe the most important topic. So, so thank you so much, and thank you, dear listeners, and until next time, stay rational. Thank you so much for spending your valuable time with us exploring the history of economic thought. You are welcome to email comments and suggestions to stefan at cpas.dk. Please like and share and recommend this podcast anywhere you can and think it's relevant. Until next time, stay rational. Yeah.